end, a little more Trick Room oriented, potentially with Clefairy, Registeel, Grimmsnarl, Landorus, Torkoal, and Venusaur. And then on Nick's side, you have Glorian Moltres, Metagross, Raikou, Whimsicott, Incineroar, and Tapu Fini. So you still have some, some Bulldoze <laughs> weakness policy options. It's just not some of the other typical Pokemon you see, like a Spectre or Entei. Instead, it's the, the Raikou. Yeah, Raikou was honestly the Pokemon that jumped out at me on Nick's side of the field. On Kevin's side, it was that Reggie Steel that we've been seeing, you know, sort of flirting around the regional finals. But I, I don't think I've actually seen a Raikou in the Series 9 format. But, you know, it, it's very similar to Entei. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because they both get access to Inner Focus. Uh, they both have access to Bulldoze to activate Weakness Policy on Metagross um, in Nick's case. But uh, still still has a couple of key differences, like having access to electric type attacks. It almost feels like a, a simil something similar to Reggie Alecki, but has access to Bulldoze and is obviously not as powerful and not as fast. Uh, and going into this matchup in particular, I think that the Bulldoze option on Nick's team is going to be super important. Yes, you do have to worry about your opponent going for Trick Room. You see the Porygon 2, you see the Torkoal. You, you know what happens when those two Pokemon are on the field together, uh, especially when the uh, G-Max Venusaur decides to join the party as well. But I think that there is enough present on Nick's team, you know, the Whimsicott, the Incineroar, where Trick Room isn't necessarily going to be a concern. And as a result, the Metagross and the Weakness Policy and the Moltres are really going to be key in dealing damage. Uh, I really want to see Kevin go for that Trick Room mode, though, in game one, despite all that I just said, if only because if you lead Porygon 2 and Venusaur next to each other and then switch in that Torkoal, you can really put a twist on it. You can then use Trick Room late game and the Venusaur would be perfectly equipped to handle the Whimsicott or the Incineroar or just stop whatever uh, Nick wants to use to uh, stop Trick Room. So. Plenty of options from both these trainers. I think it's going to be a really exciting game one because how these trainers approach game one, I think is really going to influence what we'll see beyond that. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Gabby. The the Porygon 2 Venusaur lead is a great mind game for best of or for game one, excuse me. Because I love it, yeah. You can either you can switch Torkoal in on a trick room from Porygon, or you can switch Torkoal in for Venusaur to get the sun boost. Like there's a, a lot of things with dynamic speed that would really uh really impact that there. So, you know, let's see when uh well, let's see what these players can do here as we get started in game one between kevin salvetto and nick sefranek on the winner's side so nobody goes home after this matchup of course but you do want to stay on the winner's end so this should be a pretty fun matchup there are some cool pokemon on both trainers ends at the start it is incineroar and galarian moltres for uh, for Nick, and then Grim Snarl Venusaur is the lead on Kevin's end. So a bulky start from Kevin with the presence of the Grim Snarl, like many of the Grim Snarl we have grown to love in Series 9, does have access to light screen and reflect, can use light clay to ensure those screens last for eight turns. But more importantly, I think, uh, we'll be able to properly threaten the Galarian Moltres on Nick's side of the field because the Venusaur alone can't really do much against it. You know, Moltres will have access to Air Slash to deal some super effective damage. It could decide to go for a nasty plot, maybe even just Dynamax and Max Airstream if Nick is feeling bold. Uh, so having Grimmsnarl's support is going to be really important for this Venusaur so that it can go on the offensive and start things strong for Kevin. G-Max Venusaur is the option for Kevin here on turn one of game one in winners quarters no switch outs on either end no dynamax from nick's side as this fake out will go into grim snarl not letting it go for a light screen or a reflect or anything it wanted to this turn and nasty plot from galarian moltres is going to boost its special attack by two stages there but g max vine lash targeting down 
the Moltres slot not doing too much damage. However, both the Pokemon or both slots on Nick's side of the field will be targeted by residual damage for a few turns here. So obviously this is the similar mechanic to G-Max uh, Cannonade from Blastoise or G-Max Volcalith <laughs> from Colossal or G-Max Wildfire or Charizard. It's it's not so much the Dynamax damage you do or the G-Max damage you do from the attack. It's that residual damage every turn that really helps out. It is. And look at how much damage that Moltres has already taken even though it got the nasty plot in, which I think is going to be really helpful for Nick, the amount of damage it has taken to do so puts Moltres in a very tough spot. You can choose to Dynamax and get one, maybe two strong attacks in, but unlike the Venusaur on the opposing side of the field, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of all three of those Dynamax turns. As a result, I think this Moltres is going to have to be very careful about targeting, very careful about you know, which Pokemon you prioritize the damage on. The one thing that could happen here for this Moltres could be the Grimmsnarl attacking into it, hitting that magic number below half of its health so that Berserk activates. That could be huge, but Nick is going to have to be very careful to make sure that can happen. A Dynamax from Galarian Moltres on this end. Light screen will go up for Kevin here, so for the next for the next uh, five to eight turns, Light Clay makes it eight turns. The special attack will be cut in half. The damage will be, and that's still a lot of damage yeah. through Light Screen. Not enough for a knockout there, uh, but it is still pretty strong. Parting Shot goes into Venusaur's Protect, though, so he is not able to switch out. Uh, and now that, like, even the Incineroar, Incineroar has just been hanging out, and look how much damage it lost. It's never even been attacked at this point. That's just the, the Vine Lash damage. Yeah, that's going to be really important for this Incineroar since the more damage it takes, the more turns it has limited. You know, it can't cycle in and out as much. It can't utilize those Intimidates. Not that it really wants to at this point in time, uh, but knowing that Kevin has the Registeel in the back of his party, I think that makes Incineroar's role just that much more important. And the fact that Kevin just gave up his last turn of Dynamax to switch the Registeel in is huge. You usually only do that if you want to keep the Venusaur around for later turns. I think Kevin is so threatened by this Max Airstream, even through Light Screen, that he doesn't want to lose out on Venusaur. So that's the switching to a resisted attack on the Registeel there still does some solid damage, but Flare Blitz from Incineroar, double targeting down this Registeel, not enough to knock it out. Of course, Registeel, a very bulky Pokemon on both ends of its defenses. So this Spirit Break is super effective into Moltres, does not take a KO though, but G-Max Vine, Lift, uh. or Vine, Vine Lash in the back brings it down super, super low, but not enough for a knockout. I have to wonder the the choice to save Venusaur. That is that is something that's I just keep coming back to because otherwise, like I would have thought Venusaur could have attacked that Incineroar for the knockout, or you know maybe could have Max guarded again, or just tried to find a way through that turn that didn't involve a switch. The fact that it did involve a switch, though, to me implies that Kevin is assuming that Nick has something like that Tapu Fini in the back of his party because Venusaur is like the perfect counter for Tapu Fini in this format. And Registeel, while it does have a favorable matchup against it, uh, definitely struggles a bit more than something like Venusaur. So whether that choice is gonna come into play is something I'm very curious to follow as this game continues. Grimmsnarl will reflect on this turn, so now it's going to help against physical attacks for the next eight turns, but this max airstream out of Moltres into Grimmsnarl will be enough to knock it out, giving it yet another speed boost there. Now at this point, you would expect Incineroar to be faster, obviously, than the Registeel, so you, as Moltres knocks itself out, but honestly, it did its job. In this match. Yeah. It got three strong Dynamax attacks, excuse me, in this match. And then it knocked out the Grimmsnarl. It got a good got a good chunk of damage onto Venusaur, but the Flare Blitz will not take out Registeel because of the Protect. And now we get to see 
Nick's next Pokemon that he's going to send in. I'm not surprised that Kevin is sending in the Venusaur again. I think what Kevin's trying to do here, even though the Venusaur might not be the best Pokemon on paper against an Incineroar, uh, typing wise at least, He's trying to keep Nick guessing about what that mysterious last Pokemon in his party is. Uh, we have the benefit of seeing this game from Kevin's point of view. So we know that the last Pokemon in Kevin's party is actually going to be Porygon 2 and not the Torkoal. But as long as that question is floating around in Nick's mind, I think that uh, Nick has to play this game assuming that this Venusaur can and will outspeed all of his Pokemon at any given moment. So uh, just something to put a little more pressure on Nick Nick, I think maybe try and uh, limit his plays a little bit, knowing that the Tapu Fini uh, could just, you know, have the sunlight um, active on the field and weaken those water type attacks. Uh, it, it's a very, it's a very clever mind game here, and I think that Nick could certainly play around it. Uh, Tapu Fini does have Calm Mind, uh, but we'll have to see if he chose to this turn. Those speed boosts from Max Airstream really helping Incineroar out as it's now faster than Venusaur. Let's it parting shot for free, lowering the attack and special attack of Venusaur by one stage. And now this Earth Power is not going huh. to do as much as it would have into the Incineroar. Instead, it'll go into Whimsicott for a very resisted attack there. Whimsicott, a Pokemon that we saw a lot of at the start of the Pokemon Sword and Shield, you know, VGC era, has kind of fallen off as more Pokemon have become viable, but it's still a very strong option thanks to its prankster abilities. Combine from Tapu Fini to boost the special attack and special defense, and Amnesia from <laughs> Reggie Steel as well, boosting his special defense, saying he does not care about your combines. Whimsicott is also the fastest prankster user barring Liopard in the format. So really good opportunity here to stop the threat of a sleep powder from the opposing Venusaur can shut down the attempts of the Registeel to boost its defenses or special defenses in this case as well with a taunt. So a great switch by Nick there. Also importantly, keeping that Incineroar safe for later. If this Registeel is going to spend a few turns, you know, using that amnesia to boost up its special defense having a physical pokemon left in the back of your party in order to come in and deal that damage for a knockout is going to be super helpful you have to assume that nick is counting down the turns that this light screen and reflect is active as well and is trying to time it so that he attacks when that's right fake tears from the Whimsicott will harshly lower Venusaur's special defense. Sludge Bomb into Ooh. Whimsicott. That's a big one. That's a four times super effective attack there. So Whimsicott being knocked out. Calm Mind from Tapu Fini yet again. So that's now plus two in its special attack and its special defense. That special defense honestly being very important against the, the Venusaur there. It's going to help yeah. you endure that hit. And where Reggie Steel was just a few turns ago, Gabby, to being a couple of hit points away from knocked out to, you know, like 40% of its HP from, from leftovers recovery is, uh, is pretty nice. It is pretty nice, but I would have thought that the Whimsicott would have prioritized taunting the Reggie Steel over going for the fake tears into the Venusaur. While Tapu Fini certainly appreciates the fake tears, I think that that turns a Moonblast into a decent choice against Venusaur, whereas you normally wouldn't say that at all, ever. Um, I think that the Registeel sitting on the field here is going to be really important for Nick to keep an eye on. If you let the Registeel sit around for too long, using those supportive moves to boost its defenses to get its health back, uh, that's going to start adding up very quickly. Wow, that Muddy Water does absolutely nothing to Registeel. Accuracy drop not coming in, though, uh, for for the Venusaur on this turn, at least, as it does connect into Incineroar, knocking it out. And the Body Press actually not going to do a lot into Tapu Fini. Looks kind of weird, but what I think it was is Kevin was expecting, well, Incineroar can't fake out both of these Pokemon, so I'm going to double target that slot, and whichever yeah. one he doesn't fake out is what I'm going to use to knock out Incineroar. I think you're absolutely right, Joe. And getting a little bit of chip damage down on Tapu Fini is also going to be important because these special defense boosts are going to make it very difficult for Venusaur to find that KO otherwise. Uh, Sludge Bomb and Frenzy Plant are its two attacks of choice. 
I don't think we'll be seeing them now, though, because with that fake tears special defense drop, we saw how much Muddy Water did to it. We saw the accuracy drop come in as well. Kevin has the Pokemon advantage. You might as well use it to get rid of those stat drops so that when Venusaur does come in again, Takufini has taken enough damage so those moves are a one-hit knockout. Muddy Water does connect onto both of Kevin's Pokemon, including the Porygon on the switch in Reggie Steel, I think if my math is correct, took 14 <laughs> damage from a plus two muddy water, which is actually uh, ridiculous. So I think Amnesia has now maxed him out on uh, on his special defense stat, if I'm counting correctly, on the turn. So basically, Reggie Steel is able to raise its special defense significantly faster than Tapu Fini is able to raise its special attack to counteract the Amnesia. That is correct. Unfortunately, though, both these Pokemon do have leftovers, which means we might be slowing things down quite a bit here, Joe. Kevin does have two other Pokemon remaining on the field, and while I would love to see Porygon 2 go on the offensive, I, I don't think we're going to quite see that yet. I, I think we're going to see things slow down even further. Muddy Water connecting yet again on to Porygon there, bringing it down to just above 50% of its HP. Does get an accuracy drop, but there is no accuracy check for <laughs> Trick Room. You're able to secure a Trick Room activation there. So the Twisted Dimensions are up on the field, letting the slower Pokemon like Porygon and Registeel attack before Tapu Finiwell in this spot. Light Screen does wear off. That's another aspect, Gabby. You forget with Grimstar, that's one of the benefits of Grimstar. It gets knocked out and you forget about that was eight turns of light screen. So not only were there amnesia boosts, but there was also the light screen helping Reggie steal out. Yep, that is absolutely correct. And I cannot help but wonder how much of a difference that made because on paper, it, it looked like it might've been maybe five or six health points of a difference, which is, is a lot when Reggie still has taken so much damage. But at the same time, we're seeing that much leftovers recovery between turns. I think that this Reggie Steel is really happy to just camp out here for a few turns longer. <laughs> and poor God's definitely happy to uh, to recover on this turn as well, since that's one of the benefits of Trick Room. You go first on Porygon, and then you recover up all the damage you lost. Another oh. accuracy drop on to Porygon there. So if it ever did want to go for an attack, it would be very, very low. It, At this point, are you like banking on a Muddy Water crit through the Reggie Steel? Is that the plan? I, I think that is the plan if you're Nick, which is kind of dangerous because even if you do get that critical hit onto the Reggie Steel to attack and ignore those special defense boosts, you still have the Venusaur in the back. Like at the end of the day, Kevin still has the Pokemon advantage, and Nick might have to focus in on that Porygon 2 a bit more to try and even up the score. Try attack missing from the accuracy drops thanks to Muddy Water, bringing Porygon down to under 50% of its HP. I really don't think try attack would have done too much anyway, but of course it still does sting to miss your attack. Reflect wearing off, but that doesn't matter anymore in this game at least. And now you're just going to have Porygon oh, recover, geez. and it's finally time. If you thought he was boosting his special defense, it's now time to boost the defense <laughs> so your body press does more damage. That is correct. So for those of you at home who need a refresher on Reggie Steel mechanics, which honestly, given the course of this tournament, I don't think so, but we're just going to go over it for our own sakes, because I think this is the first time you and I, Joe, have been in this position. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the attack body press deals damage based off of your defense stat. So by going for iron defense to boost your sp your defense sharply, you're ensuring that body press is also being powered up. And even though body press is resisted by Tapu Fini, getting it to as high of an attack as possible is going to be really important. And as we play through the next few turns of this game, I think what we're going to see is Kevin frantically trying to get to plus six defense on that Reggie Steel, maybe alternating in some protects or 
I don't know, maybe he did his damage calcs to know whether or not he needs plus two, plus four, or plus six in order to, you know, two hit knock out this Tapu Fini, for example. Uh, and then on Nick's side of the field, we're going to be seeing a lot of calm minds because the one thing that Nick does not have access to at this point in time is the same number of attacks as Kevin. He needs to make sure these muddy waters count and can get the knockout so that Porygon 2 doesn't just recover again later. Try attack actually connecting through the accuracy drops, does minimal damage, has a chance at getting a status affliction, but no, or status condition, but no. Nothing on that turn. And the muddy water into Porygon bring it oh, back no. under half. Yet another accuracy <laughs> drop. So I would I believe that makes it less accurate than, you know, uh, than at this point, the, you're more likely to miss than actually connect at this point on try attack. Uh, but it doesn't matter as the Twisted Dimensions return to normal. Honestly, I don't see a problem with just getting up to plus six. Go for another Iron Defense. You why not? Uh, right? I don't. I don't know what plus four is enough. I understand that like you you're plus four and you have an insanely high defense stat, but you might as well. You're you're essentially banking on not getting crit anyway so you might as well get that iron defense boost to plus six porygon sets up trick room here and then you go really fast and hit as strong as you possibly can uh i i guess this is a difficult decision decision as time is running down we are under three minutes yep. left in this game yeah and the timer is going to be key i don't think these players are necessarily playing at this point for knockouts as their win condition i think that kevin's best win condition at this point in time is to mind the timer as long as he has the pokemon advantage more pokemon than nick then he's guaranteed to win this game regardless of what happens this is the most, with a critical hit on Porygon, knocking it out. This is the most accurate Muddy Water, you know, <laughs> shenanigans I've ever seen. As, as this Muddy Water is essentially connected almost every time at this point. Uh, as anyone with experience using Top Infinity understands that that is not always the case. Uh, that you hit all your Muddy Waters. But now Venusaur is able to switch in, kind of luckily, for Porygon to uh, not get Trick Room up now. As Venusaur is able to be the fastest Pokemon on the field here. It doesn't have that special defense drop anymore, Gabby, so it is going to take a lot less damage from a, from a Muddy Water than the last time. But what attack do you go for? Do you go for Sleep Powder knowing that Misty Terrain is no longer active on the field and just hope that it connects? Do you go for the Frenzy Plant and just accept that you're not gonna get a one-hit knockout on it because of those call mind boosts and just hope that your opponent isn't able to find a knockout on Venusaur in those next couple of turns? If Nick is able to find a KO on either the Registeel or the Venusaur, he will win this game because Tapu Fini is at full health. And the second tiebreaker rule has to do with how much health is left. And the seconds are counting down, Joe. Under 50 seconds left in the battle. Sleep Powder misses, Moonblast doesn't get the KO. And that's a, a max body press doing 40% to Tapu Fini. So it's literally, uh, I think Kevin in this spot, you just double protect or try to keep you it because can. if, if, oh, it's right, Venusaur doesn't have protect. So if, if, if you don't knock out Tapu Fini in this spot, then you lose the game because Fini has more HP than Registeel if Venusaur goes down. Yes, but you can also look at the amount of time available to Kevin to pick his move relative to when the battle ends. If Kevin lets this timer run out, then this will be the end of the battle. So even though it came down to the absolute wire, Venusaur was just able to hold on with that little sliver of health, ensuring that Kevin had that Pokemon advantage to win game one. Wow, a, a yeah. match literally, literally, <laughs> you know, not metaphorically going down to the wire, legitimately going down to the wire as we ran out of time in game one and Kevin is able to take a very, very dr long drawn out game one there against Nick. You know, that was a, a good job out of him. 
I, I that's a nice amnesia adjustment from that's not what we've seen from the other Reggie steals in this tournament, Gabby, where they at least have like some other attack. Not I should say not every one of them has had amnesia. So you have a way with iron defense to make yourself tankier on the defensive side. You have a way with amnesia to take special attacks better there. So what can't Reggie Steel do? It's kind of the perfect Pokemon at that point. I mean, it is until you consider a parallel universe, if you will, where that Moonblast was able to knock out the Venusaur prior to the final turn. And then you kind of run into the predicament of why do you run Heavy Slam versus Amnesia? We did not see that body press do enough damage to give Reggie Steel the health advantage. And I think that's something that Kevin is going to have to keep in mind as we go into game two, because spoiler alert, this game went to timer. I wouldn't be surprised if the next game goes to timer as well. It seems like both these trainers are very comfortable with that timer, very comfortable taking their time. So uh, maybe we should just get this match started and we can keep talking about adjustments as we uh, go into our game two, because I think we're going to be seeing a lot of the same kinds of slow play from both these trainers. Definitely Pokemon like Incineroar and Registeel and Tapu Fini and Grimmsnarl, they really allow players to have a more slow paced game in VGC compared to the typical VGC action you can see where like, oh, all right, you use three Dynamax attacks and you're already up four to two and the game's over on like the fifth or sixth turn of the game. These trainers have really opted for more methodical gameplay in this matchup and, and, a, and a longer battle. And I really love that, honestly. It gives us more time to kind of sit with these teams, sit with this matchup and analyze the field and analyze what people are thinking. And it's hard to sometimes fit that in if your opponent just Dynamaxes with their Reggie Alecki and knocks you out in three hits, right? Uh, I personally really love these slower games because it really gives you an opportunity to key in on what the players are thinking. Like case in point, Kevin is taking almost till the end of his move timer, all, timer already turn one of this game too. Like I think he's, you know, thinking about that end con again and thinking about how that timer was key and making sure that he's already giving himself the opportunity to hit the game time earlier from turn one. Galarian Moltres will Dynamax yet again like we saw in game one on Nyx and it was you know so long ago we forgot that Moltres actually <laughs> did some some solid work for our Nyx team there with the three max airstream boost um, or excuse me the two max airstream boost it got some nice damage off at the beginning of the game but on this turn we actually saw Kevin click max guard on his Gigantamax Venusaur this turn expecting a max airstream from the Galarian Moltres. So if that is what Nick went for, then obviously you're gonna have an ineffective first turn here. Fake Out will stop Grim Snarl's threats this turn for any prankster attack or moves it wants to go for. And then the Max Airstream into Grim Snarl instead. So kind of calling the Max Guard or the switch on Kevin's Venusaur slot there. Nick adjusting and double targeting the Grim Snarl. It might not have even been calling a switch or calling a max guard. If we think back to turn one of game one, the Venusaur went for G-Max Vine Lash against the Moltres. And while it certainly did a lot of damage over a few turns, it did not stop Moltres from getting the maximum out of its Dynamax. So by double targeting the Grim Snarl, you're really forcing the Grim Snarl to pick. You're going to get light screen or you're going to get reflect. I have limited your time on the field to these two turns. You can pick Reflect now to stop Incineroar from Flare Blitzing. You can pick Light Screen to maybe, you know, anticipate the Tapu Fini endgame like we saw in game one, but you're only getting one this time around. Max Airstream from Moltres into Grim Snarl yet again. Grim Snarl deciding I'll go with Light Screen as that'll help right now against Gamarian Moltres and also potentially in the future against Tapu Fini if Nick brought that in the back, which we assume he definitely did at this point after how game one played out. Parting shot from Incineroar into the Venusaur. So now when Venusaur attacks with this G-Max Line Lash, it is going to be a little bit lessened because of the parting shot. Uh, maybe Kevin understanding that that was the option and deciding to go into Whimsicott, who is a grass type, so Whimsicott will be able to resist this attack. It will, but it will lose its Focus Sash as a consequence of taking damage here. Yep, Focus Sash is gone. Going to trap the, uh, or I should say, do have the trap effect taking damage 
on to Moltres, but not Whimsicott, of course, because it is a grass type. So that's the one saving grace with these G Max effects. If you're against Blastoise, or if you're a water type, Charizard is a fire type, you know, what have you. Venusaur in this case, grass types are not affected from the residual damage there uh, onto the Whimsicott. That is absolutely correct. The cool thing about switching Whimsicott in there is we didn't see the Whimsicott accomplished that much in game one. It had the opportunity to fake tears the Venusaur, but I, I don't think that necessarily really influenced the outcome of the game. It certainly put pressure on Kevin and, you know, did force that Venusaur, I think, out of the field a little bit earlier than it wanted to be. But at the end of the game, having Venusaur safe in the back honestly was preferred because of the presence of that Tapu Fini. So Whimsicott here gives Incineroar the opportunity to come back in later to possibly match that in that uh, Venusaur returning. It gives the Whimsicott the opportunity to uh, maybe go for something a little bit more effective against the Registeel this time around now that they're facing off, uh, like that taunt that I mentioned back in game one. Um, or possibly just go for the fake tears, have Moltres go for the attack, you know, double target one of these two Pokemon on Kevin's side of the field and hope that that combination is enough to remove them because both the Venusaur and the Registeel were integral to Kevin's endgame back in game one. Registeel switching out into Porygon 2, so Kevin revealing his fourth and final Pokemon in game two here being the Porygon 2 will uh, actually if this max ooze goes off we'll get a special attack boost to it as well as the download boost but max darkness from Galarian Moltres into Venusaur not doing as much damage as a max airstream would have in this case it does get a special defense drop though onto both of Kevin's Pokemon there max ooze from Venusaur is going to be Targeting the Whimsicott and knocking it out, obviously, there. Giving it another special attack to Venusaur, boost thanks to the critical hit, as well as a special attack boost to the Porygon, which I don't know if Porygon's going to be switching out anytime soon. Like, maybe that special attack boost is going to be helpful. It is. I mean, Porygon 2 is that, like, unexpected special attacker that everybody loves, right? When you get the download boost, when you get a special attack boost on it, it can do a surprising amount of damage. And unlike in Game 1, this Porygon 2 has not had its accuracy dropped to the point where it was effectively <laughs> That's useless. That's a good point, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but unlike in Game 1, the taunt into the Porygon 2 is interesting. It forces Kevin to decide this turn whether or not he wants to go for the more like offensive options of this Porygon 2 or if he really wants to save it for a possible trick room play later. I think if I were in Kevin's shoes, seeing how much damage that the Moltres and the Incineroar can do to the Porygon 2, I'd be tempted to leave it in for a turn, you know, get a try attack down, maybe even an Ice Beam into that Moltres, uh, get it within knockout range of something else on your team. Uh, but you do have to be mindful of the fact that the Trick Room was really helpful when it came to stalling out the end of game one. And eventually, you want Porygon 2 to have access to it. You want Porygon 2 to be able to recover. So maybe take an attack now, see how much damage it does, get some confirmation about how bulky your opponent's Pokemon are, uh, and then switch things around a little bit so that you can have that sort of slow Trick Room endgame that we saw in game one. Venusaur switching out on this turn into Registeel, maybe wanting Registeel to take the potential fake out instead, or the Flare Blitz instead, I should say. Has no fake out for Nick. Flare Blitz instead is the Ooh. answer, and that will do half to Registeel. Doesn't get a burn. Well, I was you know, thinking if that would actually help Nick out a lot, is <laughs> if you could land a burn on it because that would negate the leftovers recovery. And there is still the G Max Vine Lash, you know, residual damage for at least, I believe, at least one more turn. On, uh, on this end, but that might have actually, that might have been it. I can't, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember how many turns it, it, it stays around for, because it's a lot. It, it is a lot, and that's why it really makes a difference. And even if you don't keep your Venusaur around on the field long enough to utilize all of those Gigantamax turns, getting one G-Max Vine Lash in can certainly be game-defining. Uh, going into this late game, I think it's very interesting that the Moltres has been allowed to sit on the field for as long as it has. 
I think that this Moltres is in the perfect spot at this point to start relying on Fiery Wrath until it does get knocked out. Maybe Incineroar going for a parting shot to weaken that Porygon too, or, uh, you know, pivot things around a little bit. And so that Tapu Fini, again, assuming that's Nick's last Pokemon, has the same advantages it had back in game one. Fiery Wrath will also have the chance to flinch as well on top of the solid damage it did oh, there. Flare and Blitz gets the knockout. into Registeel. No party shots in this turn, Gabby. We're going straight <laughs> for damage. We're not messing around on Nick's end. Knocking out Registeel, you don't want to get into that position you found yourself in last game where you let the Registeel boost. Stuff like that. Try attack thanks to the special attack boost, actually will knock out Galarian Moltres there. And so... The taunt wearing off on this turn for Porygon 2. Kevin is down to his final two Pokemon. Nick is as well, as we assume he's going to bring the Tapu Fini in to this slot next to the Incineroar. But that means no more fake outs from, from Incineroar, you know, nothing like that. So he's, he's stuck in at this point going for attacks. I'm very surprised that the Registeel did not protect that last turn since the double into that spot uh, was, I think, very predictable from Nick. So I, I don't know necessarily what the Registeel was trying to accomplish. I think it, I think it locked into uh, one of those defensive boosting moves that we saw back in game one. Uh, but still, as long as the Incineroar is on the field, you have to be very careful about that Reggie Steele's positioning. And I think that's something that Kevin will have to carry with him into game three if we get to see one. Sludge Bomb from Venusaur into Incineroar brings it down very, very low. Not enough for a knockout, though, but definitely enough for Porygon 2 to clean up in that uh, on its second attack here. Combine from Top Infinity boosting its special attack and special defense by one stage. Flare Blitz is actually just going to knock himself out, Incineroar will after this recoil but he takes venusaur down with him in this spot so now it's one to one with tapu fini versus pouring on two it's kind of similar to what we had last game except there's no reggie steel at this point try attack is doing some okay damage but it's going to be negated a lot by the leftovers for right now you also have to deal with the misty terrain right so yep. you kind of Porygon 2 kind of hanging out, waiting till Misty Terrain goes around. Maybe you can get a nice, you know, paralysis or a, or a, or a freeze or a burn to negate leftovers or something there. This is uh, this is going to be a slow end game too. It is, and while Porygon 2 buys its time for the Misty Terrain, it's the perfect opportunity for Tapu Fini to get back up to, I think it was plus three special attack we saw from it in game one. That did about 50-ish percent to a Porygon 2 from a Muddy Water single target, which means it should be in the 60 to 70, definitely within the two hit knockout range for single target. But I think honestly, the benefit of having it down to Porygon 2 versus Tapu Fini in the end game is that you no longer have to rely on Muddy Water. Like we saw those accuracy drops really do a lot of work for Tapu Fini back in game one. But I think in this end game, you're primarily looking for damage. You want to put Porygon 2 in a position where it cannot recover and you just get that knockout easy. and move Moonblast is just way more consistent. Ooh. And you also have the opportunity of a special attack drop, which is uh, quite honestly, I think more valuable <laughs> in this specific end game. Absolutely. And this turn, so I was gonna say, is he gonna keep calm minding? Is he gonna go for a, a Moonblast? That turn, he forced a recover out of out of Porygon. Of course, the battle is canceled anyway, so uh, we are going to see a game three in this spot. Uh, but if we just you know, recap quickly over that last turn there, because you Moonblasted, now Porygon has to recover, which gives you yep. a free Combine again the next turn. So Nick really playing that end game beautifully there to force this game three. I mean, you also don't necessarily have to go for Calm Mind in that situation. If you're happy with the amount of damage that Moonblast did, you can just keep using Moonblast. So, you know, Moonblast recover, Moonblast recover, Moonblast recover. Uh-oh, Trick Room's up. I can no longer recover first. Moonblast knockout game three. So uh, I think it's up to you as like a person, how you want to play through that end game. Um, I think that if I were in Nick's shoes, I probably would have taken the Calm Mind just to be safe. It's very easy to get, see the win con, you know, right there on the horizon and just kind of charge towards it. But uh, very well played from both Nick and Kevin. I really love the adjustments going into 
game two. And I think we saw the Incineroar and the Moltres really do a ton more work in this game. And getting the early knockout on the Registeel was really the defining moment between game one and game two. So going into game three, I think that Kevin needs to focus on that Registeel. He needs to make sure he can get it onto the field in a situation where it won't immediately be two hit knockout. Because even though it was, you know, both the Moltres and the Incineroar attacking that slot in that turn, Fiery Wrath is going to hit both Pokemon anyways. I, I don't think there's necessarily like a cost for Moltres to go for that. And it just felt like a very comfortable knockout for Nick to get. Yeah, I think uh, it was a real team effort on Nick's end. The for what I think of, Incineroar was really impactful there, right? Got the yeah. two Flare Blitz off into Registeel, got the clean knockout onto Venusaur as well. So, you know, most of the damage it took in that match was actually from uh, itself and Flare Blitz recoil, except the one Sludge Bomb, right? So uh, I think that was a pretty, uh, a pretty strong showing as to why Incineroar is such a strong utility Pokemon. You have Fake Out, Pressure, you have Intimidate, you have Parting Shot to reposition. But Flare Blitz is also the strongest, you know, fire attack of physical uh, fire Pokemon can use, right? So that just shows oh, yeah. that the capabilities it has. Let's see what happens between these two trainers here, Nick and Kevin, in Game 3. First two matches have been very fun, very back and forth, bringing down to the wire, 1-1. One to one. The first one was 2-1, to one. this one is 1-1 one to one at the end, right? So you have Galarian Moltres and Cineroar yet again for Nick on the top of the screen and then on the bottom with Grim Snarl, Venusaur. So these these trainers saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Go for that same lead. You're expecting a fake out. The only difference now is you have the mind games of three games in a row where it's like, does he go for Max Guard? Does he switch out? Does, does Moltres Dynamax? Does Moltres Nasty Plot? This is still a pretty tricky turn. It is a pretty tricky turn, but I think Nick is going to take a page from the previous game and double into the Grim Snarl this turn one. Uh, maybe not necessarily with the Dynamax, though I think personally I would want to get that Max Airstream so that you're guaranteed to outspeed the Venusaur just like right off the bat. Um, and ensure that the Grim Snarl will only have one opportunity to get that light screen or get that reflect up on the field. Uh, I think that in game one, having both those screens active, even though we didn't see reflect I'd have as big of an impact throughout that game, is just something that uh, it's just another something that you have to be mindful of and uh, certainly would help the Incineroar. Uh, you know, be able to get that knockout on that Registeel a bit quicker. So you have to remove the Grim Snarl, so that just isn't possible. Nick will Dynamax his Galarian Moltres yet again, like he has done in the first two games. And Kevin, of course, on his end, is going for Gigantamax Venusaur. It really is the best option if you think about it on his team. You don't want Porygon to take it. You don't necessarily want Registeel to take the, the, the Max on your end. So Venusaur makes perfect sense in this scenario in this game three and you're gonna have the fake out from incineroar targeting down grim snarl yet again now does kevin adjust because there is no max guard but max airstream from moltres goes into venusaur oh. not the grim snarl this time around and that brings venusaur very very low you know without a max guard he's not safe obviously and the gmax vine lash is resisted into both oh. of Nick's Pokemon, but the weakness policy <laughs> activation saying, I don't care about resistances. This Venusaur is gonna attack for a lot of damage with G-Max Vine Lash into Incineroar, <laughs> doing over half of Incineroar's HP. I can't even explain how impossible that sounds that a grass attack took out 50% of, and even more now, like 60% of Incineroar's health. I'm very surprised that Nick went for that airstream into the Venusaur, knowing that it is holding the weakness policy. Grimmsnarl will be able to get a screen up this turn, and I, I suppose Nick only has to target down that Venusaur with the Moltres, and even through light screen, I think a max airstream should pretty comfortably take that KO at this point in time. But so much chip damage down onto the Incineroar from turn one means that it's probably going to get knocked out by G-Max Vine Lash in a couple of turns. It can't use Flare Blitz anymore because it will be taking a ton of recoil damage. This responded to the Incineroar's presence in game two perfectly. Light screen from Grimmsnarl going to 
make the special attacks on its end or take them, you know, a lot better for the next eight turns. Max Airstream front into Grimmsnarl doesn't get the knockout though. Calling a Max Guard though, potentially on Kevin's end, so that was a smart decision from Nick understanding that the Venusaur felt threatened, so it might go for Max Guard on this turn. And now next turn, you can target it down because you know it's not gonna be able to protect again. Flare Blitz from Grimstar. Let's <laughs> Grimstar live on one HP. Incineroar <gasps> knocking itself down into the red and no oh. burn either. So Grimstar, the luckiest Pokemon on the field, gets to live at one HP and Incineroar doesn't even hang out because it gets knocked out from the Vine Lash damage. That was an insane turn. That was an insane turn. And now that Incineroar is gone, I don't think Kevin has to rely on the Reflect as aggressively as we saw him in game one, since that Pokemon that really threatens the Registeel, from what we've seen at least of Nick's Pokemon, is no longer present. Nick also being forced to reveal the Whimsicott a little bit sooner than I think he wanted to. I, I think the Whimsicott most likely wanted to wait until that Grimmsnarl was out of the way and that the Porygon 2 or the Registeel were back on the field to get that taunt in one of those spots. Instead, I think Whimsicott almost forced to go for a Moonblast this turn, pick up the KO on Grimmsnarl, allow the Moltres to focus in on the Venusaur, and then bring Kevin down to his last two Pokemon. But it looks like Kevin is switching around so that uh, that game plan just isn't possible. If I'm Kevin and I just saw Incineroar go down, I see this as free real estate for Reggie Seal to switch in. Oh That's exactly <laughs> what Kevin goes for as the biggest threat to it has been taken down. Taunt from Grimmsnarl will stop the uh, will stop the the Whimsicott there, but this Max Airstream not doing a lot into a resisted Pokemon being a Steel type in the Reggie Steel speed boost isn't going to matter too much as they are very fast Pokemon in this spot. Um, but you ha will have Moonblast, and that's, that is why Grimmsnarl went first, right? Because it went for a priority Prankster yep. move, where Whimsicott went for a normal attack, which has normal priority. So the Moonblast does take care of that pesky one hit point on Grimmsnarl at this point, knocking it out, bringing Kevin down to his final three Pokemon here. So here we are, three to three right now in game three. Whimsicott almost forced to leave the field, assuming that Moonblast is not going to accomplish much against the Registeel, against the Porygon 2. Uh, and really, Whimsicott, I think the choice by Nick to provide support to ensure that the slower play of these two Pokemon together on Kevin's side of the field cannot exist. Nick could switch in the Tapu Fini here and get prepared for a slow game, but I think Nick's in a spot where he really wants to stop Trick Room, and the only way he can do that is rely on a Fiery Wrath and getting a flinch. So it, it's going to be close. If Kevin can get Trick Room up here, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of defense again from this Reggie Steel, similar to what we saw in Game One. So uh, buckle in, Joe. It's going to be another long ride. Just what I want to see, more defensive switching and pivoting. Critical hit on Saporion 2, though, so that does some nice damage. Thanks to the Life Orb, critical hit. And Iron Defense out of Registeel. It is Registeel's time to shine. This has been Registeel's <laughs> tournament the whole way. We've seen so many people take advantage of this Pokemon and its utility that it provides on a team. And honestly, how strong it is in this format, in the VGC Series 9 format that vine lash still doing some damage onto finney at this spot but um i you know as we as we as we said on the i hope everyone at home has been already <laughs> eating their popcorn because at this point it would have taken too long you don't want to start getting the popcorn ready now in game three you wanted it for the whole set i think the the win condition at this point, I was wondering if Whimsicott wanted to taunt either Registeel or Porygon to stop Trick Room potentially or yes. stop the Iron Defenses, but instead went for the Finny switch in. I, Whimsicott couldn't have because of its own taunt. And as a result, Nick oh, is right. forced to switch it back on the field now, which is great to have the Moltres in the back of your party so that once Trick Room is over, you will outspeed and you will have some sort of offense choice. But you're definitely in a tough spot now to find your way through these Trick Room turns, especially when Porygon 2 just does so much damage as is. 
Oh, the Ice Beam almost getting a knockout in one hit there. Not enough. Whimsicott barely hanging on as Tapu Fini goes for another Calm Mind. Reggie Steel also went for an Amnesia there to match that Calm Mind. So um, now Whimsicott can potentially taunt one of the targets there. It is no longer taunted. That's why I had to switch out before. You know Moltres is in the back, so you are safe to Ice Beam this Whimsicott slot, like no matter what, because you're either hitting Whimsicott or Moltres, right? Uh, Trick Room is up currently, but Prankster doesn't care about the Trick Room priority there as it would be moving faster. And Tapu Fini still incredibly healthy, can keep trying to calm mind if it wants to. Oh no, he didn't go for Taunt. No Taunt, instead it's the Fake Tears in the two, the Porygon 2 lowering his special defense by two stages, but this lets Reggie Steel just get another Amnesia up, boosting his special defense, and, and that will completely counter the attacks from Tapu Fini. Ice Beam knocks out Whimsicott in this position. So yeah, Porygon 2's minus two special defense, sure, but it is now not taunted from stopping, uh, resetting up Trick Room later, Aww. or going for a recover or something like this. And then the Moon Blast doesn't even knock out. So I think maybe Nick banking on the chance of Fake tears into Moonblast, KOing Porygon, and that would have been able to, to put him in a better spot here. But the taunt was right there to stop this amnesia on Registeel. It's a tough call because the Registeel could have very well went for Protect, and Porygon 2 could have then picked up the knockout on Whimsicott that turn. And I think Nick was making a prediction that there would have been that protect on the Reggie Steel at least. Trying to go for the fake tears followed by the Moon Blast does put Kevin in a position where even if he does recover the Porygon 2, the attack from Moltres and Tapu Fini together should be enough to pick up that knockout. So it, it's not necessarily, you know, the uh, the be all end all, so to speak, of uh, Porygon 2, but uh, still, I. I think the taunt into the Reggie Steel would have been way more important for Nick to get, given that as soon as these amnesia boosts are there, Nick is going to be in a very difficult position for the end game. Protect from Moltres, iron defense again from Reggie Steel, getting its defense even higher to make body press do more damage later on. The Ice Beam goes into no Protect recover. and Tapu Fini will calm mine. So that's a third calm mine boost for Tapu Fini. I do want to point out, Gabby, the the Galar fans, the the people in the stadium, they've been hyped this whole set. They've been saying a lot. They got the gym leader theme going on. They've been just as excited about it as we have been this whole time. I hope everyone watching the match enjoys it as well. This is, this is honestly, it's been slow, but this has been a really fun set, a fun best of three. A very good opportunity to get into both Kevin and Nick's thoughts and figure out what they're, you know, thinking, how they're playing their end game. Porygon 2 did not go for recover last turn. That was something very risky. And I think Kevin acknowledging that Nick was not going to go on the offensive with that play. A very oh, important to watch protect. out for. Yep, failing double protect on Moltres, so it does not save itself from this body press, knocking it out and bringing Tapu Fini back down as the only Pokemon on Nick's end to try to win this match. Kevin will recover this turn for uh, for Porygon, bringing it back up pretty healthy. Kamon yet again, now plus four on Fini. This is actually the strongest we have seen Nick's Tapu Fini in the entire set at this point. Uh, so, it, and you're going to need that strength at this point down three to one as, twisted, as the Twisted Dimensions return to normal. A perfect opportunity for Tapu Fini to go on the offense with Muddy Water or the Moon Blast. I, I think you have to risk the Muddy Water if only because both the Registeel and the Tapu Fini are now at full health, and whichever Pokemon takes more damage is going to be important, but you miss the Porygon too if you go for that. Finally, Muddy Water oh. misses is what I imagine Kevin is exclaiming right now as it hits so many times before. Tapu Fini is also plus three at this point, not plus four, as I said earlier. So this Trick Room, because of no Muddy Water, able to get Trick Room back up and letting Porygon 2 and Reggie Steel go oh. faster for the next four turns. And honestly, even though Light Screen wears off, that just might seal it at this point. 
It's it's tough to say. The fact that Kevin was able to get Trick Room up for a second round of five turns is going to be very important, especially when you look at Tapu Fini versus Reggie Steele, which is where this game is ultimately going to come down to. If Nick is able to find a quick knockout on this Porygon 2, now he can certainly try and recover lost ground, but that was a very key muddy water miss in that previous turn. Porygon 2 back up to full HP, but not for long as Muddy Water does connect this time around. And clean <laughs> knocking out Porygon thanks to a critical hit. I think that's the third time this set P2 has been crit in this <laughs> by Tapu Fini. So uh, that's very unfortunate for Kevin as now he brings in the Venusaur who is not very healthy, right? Yeah, obviously you no. have two to one advantage, but Trick Room is up which you would assume Tapu Fini is, now, is slower and would underspeed the the Venusaur, right? Unless it's some weird Venusaur variant. Uh, Usually you run a lot of speed on it. Yeah, I, I would make the same assumptions as well. I, I gotta say, there was something very satisfying though about watching that Porygon <laughs> 2's health meteor just like drop. That was... Oh my god, and that does that, so much damage too! That's a resistant attack, Wait, ladies what? and gentlemen. That's a resistant Wait. attack doing over half. Sleep Powder does on. connect onto Tapu Fini. In so that means room. Venusaur is slower in Trick Room. Is this a fast Fini? I don't know. That that is that is very unusual to have Venusaur under speed Tapu Fini in Trick Room is definitely an indication of how these Pokemon are trained. It's possible, it's possible that Kevin's Venusaur is actually trained to be slower and rely on the uh, chlorophyll ability to make up for that lack in speed. But that Sleep Powder Connect there is huge and ultimately what gave him the game. 75% <laughs> of the time you move on in the oh winner's bracket at Global Finals. Congratulations to Kevin Salvetto, an exhilarating best of three set.